Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Matthew Clary. I'm a visiting professor in the Department of Political Science here at Auburn. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here. I'm pleased to see all of you to engage with this very clearly timely and important topic. Um, I can't think of something you know, frankly, anything more important that we could be talking about right now. Um, and we have, you know, several important guests that are going to hopefully shed some light on this crisis and uh, maybe some ideas about, you know, ways we can move forward. Um, this event is the product of um, collaboration among several different entities. So the Korea Corner um, here at the University, or Auburn University, the Office of Professional and Continuing Education, the Office of University Outreach, as well as the Department of Economics, Department of Foreign Languages and Literature and the Department of Political Science and a big shout out to the Consul General of the Republic of Korea in Atlanta. Um, without their support, this event wouldn't be possible. So please thanks all, all, all of our sponsors. All right, so to get things started, um, we're actually going to ask um, Dr. Roy Rickers Cook, um, the Associate Provost and Vice President for University Outreach, um, to come and talk a little bit about um, preparing for the event um, and the Korea Corner and sort of the outreach activities for the university. Um, so if you'll come join us, please. Good evening. Oh, that's a little loud. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, let me first say thank you to all of you for spending your evening here with us uh, to learn more about uh, the North Korea, the South Korea, uh, members of our community here. Uh, we're absolutely delightly, delighted to have you here. Um, I want to thank uh, Hope and Dr. Yu and Dr. Saul for uh, putting this on. Uh, like it was just said, it's a very timely topic. It's something that we try to do in university outreach beyond just engaging in communities, but staying sort of cued in into topics of the day. And I think that uh, this is an extremely important topic and one that we need to be learning more about and talking about as a community. Uh, years ago, uh, about three or four years ago, maybe a little bit more, Dr. Saul, I think about five or six years ago, uh, Dr. Saul approached me about uh, some of the work that she had underway in the College of Education uh, with uh, career-related initiatives. And one of the things that she wanted to do, and I thought was extremely important, was to better engage our teachers uh, in the public schools to the Korean culture. And when she approached me about a program that she had underway where she wanted to take uh, teachers from both Opelika, Auburn, and surrounding schools to South Korea to get them sort of engaged in the culture and better understand the people from South Korea, I immediately said, absolutely, University Outreach will support this. And so for the last five or six years, we've supported teachers in this community to travel to South Korea to get a better understanding of the culture, the people, because uh, Korean kids will be in our classrooms. And so they need to know more about the students that they will be teaching. And so that was just sort of the start of what we wanted to do as it relates to reaching out uh, to the growing commu uh, Korean community. And I think we've done a, a pretty good job. And this is evident of how we're making this a priority within university outreach. Uh, I think as the year goes on and in coming years, you're going to see more and more programming that is related to the Korean community. Uh, they are our partners, they are our friends, and we're happy to have them here in this part of the state. And so we want to make sure that we highlight uh, the great ways that we can continue to partner, even beyond the automotive industry. And I would like to acknowledge all of the various representatives and presidents from the various suppliers and automotive industries that's here. They've been great supporters of our work here uh, with uh, the Korean community. Let me just say that uh, I, I think that this, again, is a very important topic. I think our panelists here, as you will see, as they share their insight, knowledge, and experiences about uh, North Korea, the conflict, the background, uh, you will find it very insightful. And so please enjoy this evening and thank you again for coming. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Astrup. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. I want to first of all thank the Auburn community for coming out to uh, hear our speakers tonight. You know, we really do stand on the precipice of a pretty important crisis. Um, not long ago, North Korea was able to obtain the nu a nuclear weapon. Uh, and they now have ICBMs that can deliver those nuclear weapons any place, well, many places around the globe. And they have shown that uh, they have leadership that uh, is a little less than stable. And so as a consequence, we really are facing a crisis, not just here in the United States, not just in South Korea, but in many places across the globe. 
And it's an international crisis that we all need to take note of and that we all need to sit down and think long and hard about what we're going to do and how we're going to approach it. And that's what this panel here tonight really is all about, is beginning that, di that dialogue and talking about what we can do to really make sure that a crisis is averted. And that's the most important thing that we can possibly do, is avert any type of crisis. Um, and so, without further ado, I do want to thank, first of all, all the entities that were involved here today. This really does represent a very special collaboration. I especially want to thank uh, the Korea Corner for all that they've done, the, the, the South Korean government for all it, it's done to sponsor this event. But especially I want to thank my colleagues right up here in front, uh, those of, who are from the Department of Political Science, Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures, the Department of uh, Economics, who have uh, taken the time to really, first of all, become deeply involved and deeply versed on the issues before us, and to, pr to provide, I think, a very important and thoughtful discussion on this issue. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Matthew Clary, who is a, a visiting professor at the Department of Political Science, and he's going to sit that he's going to talk to us through this particular uh, dialogue. Thank you, Matthew. All right, thank you, Dean Astrup. We we actually have one final speaker opening remarks um, from the Deputy Consul General of the Republic of Korea in Atlanta, um, Lee Sang Ho. On behalf of the Korean Consulate in Atlanta, I'm pleased to be able to join you at the. Uh, uh, today's uh, symposium. I would like to express my appreciation to Auburn University and its career corner uh, for arranging this event. <coughs> uh, the biggest the challenge the Korean Peninsula is facing is uh, the North Korean nuclear ability. Uh, North Korea is continuing its nuclear and missile provocations, threatening peace not only on the Korean Peninsula but also in Northeast Asia and even the world. Despite the international community's concerted demand and warnings, North Korea carried out its sixth uh, nuclear test a few months ago and the continued missile provocations. The UN Security Council adopted unanimously a North Korea sanctions resolution with tougher uh, measures than the previous ones. Uh, this clearly shows uh, that the, the international community is collectively out raised and is uh, responding on the one voice on the Korean Peninsula, uh, North Korean nuclear issue. The South Korean government and, and the international community uh, are making every possible effort with a great determination to peacefully solve the North Korean nuclear issues. The UN Security Council sanction resolutions against North Korea are also part of this effort. South Korea does not desire the collapse of North Korea. We will not seek unification by adoption or artificial means. If North Korea make a decision even now to stand on the right side of history, uh, we are ready to assist North Korea together uh, with the international community. North Korea must immediately cease making reckless choices that could lead to its own isolation and downfall and choose the path of dialogue. I believe today's symposium will enable you to better understand the Korean um, Peninsula's current issues. Thank you. All right, so the next step is I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel of experts. Um, our first panelist on the far left is Dr. Hyung Woo Kim. Uh, he's a professor of economics here at Auburn. Um, some of you may have had his classes, um, and he's an expert in the areas of macroeconomics, financial economics, and economic forecasting. Um, so he'll speak on the growing prospects for conflict from an economist perspective, um, and the potential economic impact this crisis may have on the global, national, and the local economy, um, something that we often don't see um, covered very frequently in the news, so a, a perspective we, I think we'd all be really interested to hear. Our second panelist um, in the middle is Mr. William Brown. He's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University in their School of Foreign Service, and is an expert on the economies of China, Japan, and Korea, as well as North Korea more generally. Uh, he's worked as a policy analyst for the U.S. government in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Commerce Department, the National Intelligence Council, and for the U.S. Embassy in the Republic of Korea. 
Mr. Brown will speak on the economic impact of the North Korean conflict uh, on the nations of East Asia, including an analysis of the sanctions that have been placed on the nation and the status of the North Korean economy. And then our final panelist, um, immediately to my left, is Dr. Lawrence Grinter. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at the Air War College and a specialist on international and national security policy. Dr. Grinter will speak on the national security implications of the North Korean nuclear weapons program and the range of policy options available to the leaders of the United States and the Republic of Korea. Um, so please join, help me, uh, join me in welcoming these panelists to Auburn. So how this panel will work is first, each panelist will do a short presentation um, to present information and background um, that will facilitate our discussion later on. And that'll be followed by um, a moderated discussion among um, the four of us. And finally, there'll be some time for questions and answers from the audience. We wanna um, address any concerns or questions that you all might have as well. Um, so if Dr. Kim, you would like to get started. Hi, good evening. I, I'm Hyung Kim and I'm a professor of economics at Auburn University. Uh, I'm not exactly an you know, the expert in North Korea problem, <laughs> okay, but I'm from Korea. Okay, so <laughs> I'll try to you know, deliver some you know, the information about North Korea. Okay, and uh, I normally don't use lots of pictures and you know, that kind of, you know, the of funny things, but you know, the, I thought you guys might be bored, so I tried to, you know, to, uh, help you wake up. So, you know, the, I added some, you know, the kind of funny, you know, the pic, pic, uh, graphs and pictures. Okay, so I hope you enjoy. Okay, and the title of today's event is the North Korean conflict and where are we headed? And I'm trying to explain. I'm going to try. Um, to explain uh, an answer from an economist point of view, okay? Okay, where are we headed? And uh, this is a Facebook, in a uh, screenshot of a Facebook page of this event. Uh, I'm a huge you know, Facebook <laughs> fan, and I access to the Facebook page like every like an hour or so, okay? So I was looking at this you know, the, uh, page, and uh, I found there were you know, the two comments here, somewhere here, right? Two comments here. Uh, right now, I think uh, there are like a four comments, but at, this, at the time, I you know, they made a screenshot, and there were two comments. So I was really curious. They may have some answer, <laughs> okay? They may have some answer about you know, the where are we headed. And so I clicked on it, and uh, here is an answer. Oh, well, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, uh, one of the guy, you know, the, uh, gave an answer, uh, were. <laughs> uh, I don't know, you know, uh, this is not really, you know, the, uh, I mean, this is kind of gloomy and sad kind of answer. I wasn't expecting this, but um, that may be true or maybe not be true, I don't know. But I do not know whether this, I can believe this. Okay, because uh, this person did not give any, you know, the reason why he's saying this. So I was thinking, you know, the well, maybe I may think about some answers from an economist's point of view. Okay, to this question. Okay, so for that purpose, you know, the we need to gather some information about North Korea. But you know, unfortunately, not much is known about North Korea, right? Uh, how many of you know who this guy is? Oh, okay. Actually, there are so many people. Uh, yes, sir? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Do you know who Kim Il-sung is? Uh, right. And uh, who, is, who is Kim Jong-il? <laughs> right. Okay. So this guy, uh, he is, looks so happy. <laughs> and uh, so this guy, his name is Kim Il-sung. Okay. And he is uh, the current dear leader's grandfather. Okay, uh, the current leader or dictator of North Korea, his name is Kim Jong-un, and Kim Jong-un's father was Kim uh, Jong-il, and uh, this is the father of Kim Jong-il, and uh, he's actually a founder of North Korea. Okay, so he got uh, some support from the, the old Soviet Union, and uh, he found you know, the North Korea as a socialist country. Okay, so we know that. Lots of people know that, <laughs> thank you. And uh, but we need more information to investigate what is going to happen, 
Okay, so I'd like to want to collect more information, but you know there are not much information available. So uh, I was looking at in the Google page, <laughs> and then and you know I found some information on the economy. Okay, economy. Okay, that sounds kind of interesting. So I was looking at. Of course, in North Korea, does not publish any public economic record at all. Okay, I like that picture, I know. <laughs> yeah. So North Korea does not publish economic official data. But, you know, the, fortunately, the Bank of Korea, uh, this is the central bank of South Korea, not North Korea, okay? This is the uh, central bank of South Korea. And uh, the Bank of Korea has released GDP data. GDP is a gross domestic product. That is a measure of national income. Okay, so higher, higher number for GDP means that country is wealthy country, okay? And so Bank of Korea, they gather some information from government agencies, okay? And they released you know, the North Korean GDP data since 1991. <laughs> That's wonderful, right? And here are some data. Okay, so North Korea in, uh, in 2016, their real GDP domestic product was 28 0.5 billion dollars. This sounds like a big number, but actually it is only 2.1 percent of uh, South Korea's real GDP. And the per capita real GDP was like uh, $1,300, and which is 4.5 percent of South Korean GDP. And one interesting thing was what you know the last year North Korea's you know uh, uh, has experienced a really really high economic growth, which is a whopping 3.9 uh, percent of economic growth, which is impressive. And uh, one funny thing here is what there was kind of, you know, the expansionary fiscal policy, which is military spending. <laughs> and, you know, the, during the old you know, times, you know, the Kim Il-sung's regime, uh, there was like a 30, uh, 13, uh, you know, the missile launches. And uh, during Kim jong years, you know, the regime, there were 31 missile launches and two nuclear tests, and this is Kim Jong-un. <laughs> wow, 85, 85 missile launches and three nuclear tests. Wow, <laughs> that's bad, but uh, the government has to spend some money that actually can be considered as a defense spending, which is part of the GDP. <laughs> so that created a huge boost to uh, North Korean GDP. Okay, because I have a limited time, I'm going to uh, go a little faster. And uh, so uh, North Korea exports a lot of you know, coal and those you know, the natural resources. Okay, and uh, it has increased and uh, imports also uh, increased. And uh, uh, trade with South Korea was actually shut down. Uh, last year because you know the previous you know the former uh, president Park uh, shut down the you know the Kyasong industrial complex uh, this uh, uh, industrial complex combines in south korean you know capital with north korean labor cheap labor but you know the uh, they were suspicious you know the, the money is used to develop nuclear weapon <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, they did that but you know the trade numbers didn't uh, really change why? Because of this. You know, the, this is a kind of depends of North Korea and China. Uh, North Korea is doing trade mostly with China. It is over 90%. This is China. And the rest is the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, the, as you can see, China's exports in North Korea has decreased because, you know, the North Korea wasn't able to buy much, but, you know, the China is still importing from a lot from North Korea. So. That explains why you know the North Korea was not really in bad shape, even though there were so many economic sanctions going on. Okay, however, economic sanctions will take effect pretty soon, I think. Okay, and uh, there were substantial changes so far. You know, the of course North Korea is what you know the socialist economic system, but they have transitioned to you know a market economy. That's impressive. You know, the unlike China, you know the, the government didn't do it people from the bottom. <laughs> they actually made the evolution. So this is kind of interesting thing, right? So there is a change, but of course, you know, the first thing, the North Korean government wanted to ban it, but they quickly realized it is impossible to ban, okay, because they were not able to feed them. If they can't feed them, then they have to let them trade by themselves. Okay, then you know that they are going to you know remove some responsibility, right? So they did that. So this is kind of good. I mean, the symptom I think 
Okay, they may make a change, even though the current political situation is actually hindering further economic development, so that is bad, but there is some change, that is good. And there was some improvement, uh, for example, like infant mortality rate has declined, which is good, and they, this may be surprising, more infant subscribers <laughs> have dramatically increased. You know, the, they have Egyptian mobile phone companies in North Korea. Okay, as you can see, right now, about 14% of North Korean people are using cell phone. That's <laughs> really surprising, right? Okay, that's North Korea. Okay, so it doesn't look that bad, and the American economy is great, and uh, I will skip uh, this. Uh, American economy is that, but they are colorful and <laughs> looks good, and it's absolutely good. And uh, I'm going to talk about the probability of getting a war, okay? So for that purpose, I'm going to assume, you know, the, this guy, is a Kim Jong-un, is a rational decision maker. What about President Donald Trump? I'm going to assume he's a rational decision maker. Okay, why are you laughing? <laughs> okay, so they are both rational decision makers. And I was thinking about what, uh, is there any incentive for raising a war from North Korea's point of view? And my answer is no, because North Korea is a kingdom, okay? And they try to maximize the dictator's well-being. And if there is a war, then that is the end of the Kim dynasty. So he lose everything. So I'm not going to, I don't think he will ever, you know, start a war, but he needs tension. Because he needs tension because he needs to demonstrate his capability of starting a nuclear war, so he wants to prevent any invasion. And at the same time, he also needs higher tension to remove internal enemies, okay? So from, the point of North Korea, incentive for raising a war is virtually nothing, I think, okay, but he needs tension. And what about the United States? I believe the same thing, <laughs> okay, you know, because, you know, the, there are so many people in South Korea, and a new re recent report by the Congressional Research Service shows war on the Korean Peninsula could kill 300,000 people in the first few days without even using the nuclear weapon. And it can kill more than 100,000 U.S. citizens in Korea. Okay, right now there are uh, 114,000 uh, uh, U.S. citizens in Korea, and evacuating all U.S. citizens before starting a war will take weeks. Taking weeks means, well, you know, it will give ample time to the North Korea to react, which is, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, right? So, uh, based on this thing, and the China, there are so many Chinese people, and if there is a war, then I believe the Chinese government will intervene because they want to what, you know, the protect Chinese citizens as well. So it's not going to be just a war between the South North Korea and the United States. It's going to be World War Three. So that's very, very risky action. So I believe my conclusion is what? You know, the, are we heading toward the war? And I don't think so. But uh, there is high incentive to maintain higher tension, okay, from both sides, okay? So that is uh, my appraisal, okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, I just, um, I just have some dull, uh, power, not PowerPoint, Word, Microsoft Word talking points. <clears throat> so no, no, fancy cartoons or pictures. Um, uh, it's kind of funny though, I've probably spent more time in Korea than Dr. Kim has. Um, I lived there for about 20 years growing up there as a kid and then I worked in the U.S. Embassy there in the mid-1980s. Most of my career though has been working on Northeast Asian economics, um, China, the two Koreas and Japan, and some, a fair amount on the U.S. economy as well. Um, but I'm retired from the federal government. I worked uh, extensively in the intelligence business, which means uh, I used to know a lot of secrets. I don't know if I know so many anymore. But it requires me to uh, get approval of anything I say from uh, what they call CIA publications review. I'm happy I just got, uh, I sent them my, my talking points this morning, and I got the approval about an hour ago. So I'm, <laughs> no secrets, right? <laughs> um, 
the truth is there's plenty to talk about on North Korea without getting into secrets. And one of my pet peeves is people tend to hide under the umbrella of secrecy not to explain what's going on very well. And I think our public is not well served by all the, all the huge amount of secrecy we have on North Korea. So I want to uh, undo a little bit of that, just a little bit uh, tonight. Um, what I want to do, I do, just have, a, uh, I have my smartwatch telling me to stop it. 10 minutes. So. And we have some great questions coming up, a nice discussion. I want to really have a good discussion. So I've, what I've done here is I've um, highlighted what I'm calling eight um, propositions. I'm calling them my Auburn propositions. Real short little statements that I hope will elicit some discussion of, among you and some maybe disagreements. Fine, that's great. Uh, but I'm not going to go into depth in any of them. I'm just going to sort of highlight these eight propositions. You can write them down if for the exam. That would be great. Um, but we won't go much into detail unless we want to for in the discussions. Okay? So that's kind of the way I've thought of doing this. Um, I'm an economist, and I I'm, I'm must admit I'm a bit frustrated uh, because I've been an economist working on this national security issue for upwards of 40 years, really. I started in 1976 working on North Korean economy. It's a long time. And all this time, uh, people appreciate me doing a study of economics of North Korea or South Korea, but they don't really. They really go to the military and the political. To me, I think this has been a huge mistake, and our country is uh, vastly underserved, almost disastrously recently, by not focusing on core problems with North Korea. And the core problem to me is not the nuclear issue, it's the dead gum socialist system of North Korea. So let me go through these eight points. First one is that one. Uh, the core problem with North Korea is its Marxist command economy system. All these other problems, including the nuclear weapons issue, poverty, famine, human rights issues, even the unification issue, it all boils down to this gut problem of Marxism. Uh, I can say that pretty clearly because all other Marxist economies in the world have collapsed or thrown away their Marxism. North Korea is the only one that's left. Even Cuba is not at all not like North Korea. Heritage Organization has a list of economic freedoms, countries ranking. Uh, U.S. is not number one. We're like number ten. I think Hong Kong and Singapore are like one and two, something like that. South Korea is, we're about number 10. South Korea is 27. Um, North Korea is number 180. Uh, do you know how many number, how many countries are on the list? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> 180. It's dead last. And the gap between 180 and 179 is huge. I mean, it's just off the charts. So North Korea is an extremely unusual economy, this Marxist command economy system. We don't even study it anymore. That's part of my worry is we don't, our economists have dropped the ball, we don't study Marxist econ economics anymore. It's a tragic system. And we got to understand it to understand North Korea. Uh, basic two parts of it, um, the state or collectives own all means of production. That means capital, that means resources, that even means human capital, if you think about it. And they put things together not with markets or with money, but with an incredibly uh, sophisticated, complicated central planning mechanism. Incredibly complicated, uh, where it's a big linear algebra problem fitting them. They try to duplicate, replicate a market economy so that they can change prices the way they want it. It just frankly, it's never worked and with catastrophic results, usually famine. Soviet Union, China, North Korea have all had huge famines. I'm uh, moving this like it's a um, touch screen. Um, so that's, that's the first one. The second one, this system though, even in North Korea's system, is in what I would call a slow motion collapse. Uh, the plan isn't working. It hasn't worked very well since the famine. Like Dr. Kim was saying, it's broken down. So um, um, the plan part still exists. It's important to recognize about half the economy is probably the state planned economy. The other half is uh, mostly market economy. 
um, this creates a uh, exceedingly unproductive system. Two prices for everything. And man, if you can arbitrage the difference, you can get really rich. It helps if you can use your riches to pay the policeman. So it creates incredible corruption. The system is being corrupted very badly. But the two systems still exist. Now, foreign interventions are the respons are responsible for this system. It has nothing to do with Korea, uh, certainly not the North Koreans there today. They inherited this system that was forced on them by the Soviet Union, Stalin right after World War II. Uh, China helped with their Korean War, the intervening in the Korean War. Um, uh, Eastern Europe, but the rest of us have all uh, helped that system incredibly by giving aid to North Korea. How do I know that? You can look at North Korea's trade balance. It, that's, you don't get much data out of North Korea, but trade, you can look at everybody else's trade. Everybody else in the world reports trade except North Korea. So their Chinese exports are North Korean imports. I go through this all the time looking at other countries' trade and I pull that together and create North Korea's trade. You see, it's sort of mirror imaging is what we call it. Um, so I can track North Korea's trade balances back to the Korean War. It's never run a trade surplus. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, it means somebody's been paying for their trade deficit for 70 years. Now, it could be a little bit of investment, but they don't pay back debt. Uh, a lot of that is aid from everybody, including the U.S. We've given North Korea a couple of billion dollars. South Korea has given them much more, Japan more. <clears throat> China and Russia are the, uh, or the Soviet Union are the biggest uh, betters of what is basically a beggar economy. Korea, North Korea was a great exporter before the Soviets got in there. They are the, one of the worst exporters, producers today. They're, they're pitifully unproductive country. That's why they're so poor. Um, but my main point is foreigners cause the problem. Uh, and we should remember that when we try to uh, fix the problem. Now, North, U.S. policy toward North Korea, in my view, is a disaster, a long-running disaster. And I'm becoming extremely frustrated with our own policies, especially the last 10 years. Uh, we've just sort of ignored their nuclear development. We spend an incredible amount of money, believe me, on North Korea. Tens of billions, maybe upwards of $50 billion a year. Think of our army in South Korea. Think of all of our intelligence spending. It's a lot of money. Uh, what's the result? The result is a, a North Korea with hydrogen bomb. Uh, a true disaster of our policy. Um, not an easy problem for sure, but uh, we've got the money, we've got the whole world on our side, we've got hundreds, we have lots of expertise, why haven't we somehow come to a better conclusion now? Um, so now we come, as, as our speakers have indicated, to a very critical time, it really is critical. This hydrogen-like bomb that they blew, uh, what, about a month ago, it's 10 times bigger than their previous atomic bomb. That makes a difference. Atomic bombs, we all know, are big. Hydrogen bombs are huge, okay? Think of it this way. Atomic bomb can be uh, very useful at attacking a military base. It might kill 10,000 people. If it hits Seoul, it kill maybe 20,000 people. Disaster, right? 20,000 people. Seoul has 10 million people. Uh, it wouldn't destroy Seoul. A hydrogen bomb would destroy, absolutely destroy Seoul. It would kill more than a million people. People. It's a new ball game, folks. And nor that doesn't need a, a long-range missile. It can be on a truck that blows up Seoul. So it really is a new, a new huge problem there. Um, now, um, how, what, um, what are we going to do about it? Um, I do have some ideas. I'm not actually. I'm pretty optimistic. Might not sound like it. Um, I'm thinking um, <coughs> part of our problem is Kim Jong-un isn't afraid of us. Why isn't he afraid of us? Well, we've never shot a weapon at North Korea in 70 years sitting on this DMZ. They've attacked us several times, not a lot. They sank a South Korean Navy ship 
2010, we didn't, or South Korea didn't touch them, basically, let them sink it. My gosh. They attacked a little island, shelled it, nothing happened to it. Um, so North Korea is kind of inured to uh, all our bluster and our talks. We never shoot a weapon at them. We have their whole east coast. Our Navy dominates the oceans. We all know that. We don't touch them on the east side. We stack up on the DMZ. We've done a great job. We and the, mostly the South Koreans protecting themselves from a cross DMZ attack. But we've never been on the offensive. So Kim Jong-un is not afraid of us. I would say we need to make Kim Jong-un more afraid of us. That's the only way you can defend against a hydrogen bomb, is for them to be afraid of that bomb for themselves. Um, that would be, so one part of my answer is to pro project more of an immediate kind of, not to do it, but to show that we can hit them within minutes and hit their weapons and hit their command centers with hypersonic cruise missiles, hypersonic ballistic missiles, stuff that we can shoot from the DMZ, it's not far, instantly. We see a missile ready to launch, bam, it's gone. And let them know this is coming. Uh, that's, I think, the only way you can defend yourself against in a nuclear warfare. Kim Jong-un ought to be afraid of his weapons because he's created this monster for himself that just forces us to point our guns at him and be ready to shoot. So that's part of it. The second part, though, is more long-lasting. I think we need to be ready to intervene, be intrusive in changing North Korea's system. So how do we do that? We don't ignore it. We don't not engage it. You have to engage it to change it. So I would, uh, this, I would tweak these sanctions quite a bit so that we, in effect, uh, disallow trade with the North Korean state but allow trade with private actors in North Korea. Include any, in, uh, try to encourage private activities. It might be illegal for a North Korean, well, that's okay. I, I feel fine doing illegal stuff, illegal by North Korean standards. Uh, work on that hard, work it with the Chinese, because I think the Chinese would like that also, to try to create economic reform movement in North Korea. If we spent a lot of money and a lot of activity on it, I think we could probably do that. I'm sure we could make Kim Jong-un afraid that that's what we're going to do. And that might, hopefully, cause him to come make a deal. So that's kind of the last thing. Well, let's see if that's the last thing. Um, my clock is running out. This mixed economy that they've created is incredibly vulnerable. <laughs> Uh, they use a lot of U.S. dollars. It's just amazing. Uh, and I think these U.S. dollars make them very vulnerable to uh, our interference. And uh, I think we could create some inflation. We could create a lot of problems internally for North Korea. Uh, if we don't create them, they're going to cre be created. They're creating them for themselves. So it's not a stable, North Korea is not a stable place. Um, that's scary in a lot of ways if they've got hydrogen bombs, but another way, it's a vulnerability that we should be able to use to, again, reform, change North Korea. Not attack them, not blow them up, not even uh, force unification, but to um, uh, get them basically on a China reform track. That's all I would uh, ask for. Um, now, um, China and Russia were key contributors to this problem to begin with. Russia started the whole mess. Soviet Union started the whole mess. Uh, we ought to demand that they help solve it. Um, it's in their interest to solve this mess. In fact, I think more and more of the Russians and the Chinese are realizing North Korea is a big mess in their neighborhood. It's not in their neighborhood. It's, remember, Russia touches North Korea. China is right next to it. It's a big mess for those two countries. Uh, it's not a US mess so much. It's a Soviet and Chinese mess. They need to help us solve it. And I think, actually, they are starting. I'm, I'm very help, uh, positive about uh, President Xi and Trump. I think they're hammering away and banging their heads together. And I think Kim Jong-un is paying attention. What a pleasure to be here at Auburn to uh, work with you on this particular issue. Uh, I can't imagine better timing than is occurring tonight with this. Look, uh, we've all had some uh, 
Korean experience, but I'm the one, I'm the oldest here, okay? <laughs> because on May 16th, 1961, as I was stationed at Mus Musani uh, with a Hawk Missile Battalion, Park Chung-hee took power by a coup d'etat, okay? <laughs> May 16th, 1961. Let me give you my normative position immediately before I go through these options. I believe this is the most evil regime in the world. It is corrupt. It is a Stalinist dynasty. It has ruined that country. And it's a very dangerous leadership, but a very vulnerable leadership as well. So let's go through these uh, options. These are not mutually exclusive options. I think every single one of them is under consideration and has been under consideration. And I think I'll be able to come out of this after uh, 10 minutes, if we can all stand this, uh, with a emerging policy mix that I think is occurring. Deterrence is holding. It has worked. It is working. It will work. Deterrence is not sexy. It's not fancy. It is extremely expensive. We've been at this for 65 to 70 years. There is no new Korean War. The government in Pyongyang, the governments in Pyongyang understand very clearly they will be eliminated if they attack South Korea again. But that said, under that radar, they've been very nasty. And uh, we've often seen how Deterrence allows other kinds of surrogate operations that can be very uh, difficult. Deterrence holds between the United States and Russia, between the United States and China, between India and Pakistan, between Israel and Iran. But that doesn't prevent all kinds of nasty behavior by those various governments, or some of them, underneath the nuclear threshold. Deterrence in South Korea is being robusted as we talk about it. There are, is a triple layer of defense, and this is a defensive alliance. The THAAD, the Patriot missiles, the Aegis ship uh, capabilities, all of that's holding. It's being robusted. We are selling new weapons to South Korea for purposes of defense, to Japan for purposes of defense. What about decapitation? I think it's a great idea. I'd like to see that young man have his brains blown out. As a, as a middle-level American diplomat once said to me, who had, who had met Kim Jong-il, he said, if I had the chance and was having lunch with him, I'd shoot him in the head and then finish my sandwich. Kim Jong-il is the one that presided over 900,000 North Koreans starving to death. This is as evil a regime as there's ever been. The problem with decapitation is you don't know what comes next. Sometimes it's, you gotta be very careful what you wish for. Unlike Saddam or Gaddafi or Hitler or Assad, there is no North Korean opposition, either inside or outside, with any effectiveness. We have essentially zero information on who would follow him. And would they like us? I think it's doubtful. A variation on decapitation would be a coup d'etat. Is it coming? We have no idea. How would it be instigated? Would the Chinese pay for it? Are they bribing members of the senior North Korean staff? Maybe. Maybe that's why the two executions of hundreds of executions that we know about were with two people who had deep Chinese connections the uncle by marriage to Kim Jong-un and his half-brother. We just don't know. But the Chinese among all probably have the most access to the senior North Korean military and security elite. Can you bribe them out? I don't think so. What if we were to somehow in some magic way provide North Korea half of their GDP, the North Korean government, to leave town. That would be about $16 billion. Maybe that's a third of Bill Gates' personal fortune. How are you going to get the US Congress to do that? What would they do with the money? Go over to Vladivostok and, and eat bulgogi for the rest of their lives? 
You know, sometimes bribing works with thugs. Baby Doc, Idi Amin, Mobutu, Marcos, all took the money and ran. I don't think this regime would run. I think it's isolated, it's where it's at, it has nowhere else to go. Who would take them? The information problem, the, the information ops, you better believe more can be done on this. In fact, instead of just TV videos and soap operas that come in on the flash drives, which drive the regime crazy, and which they're trying to replicate with their own TV videos and all that junk, why not put in on them the truth about that regime? And this young kid, this hidden son, who never even knew his own grandfather, and who's corrupt, how many North Koreans know that he went to school in Switzerland? Hardly any of them know this. Hardly any of them really know who he is. You know, just, just use it as a weapon and get it in. It can be put in. Sanctions, embargoes. Bill's been talking about this. Uh, we're looking at a Trump administration that is pushing for a real chokehold on the North Korean regime. It can be done, but it has to be filtered as well through the two countries that Bill was talking about, China and Russia. The Chinese, it leaks. They're smuggling, both of them. While, they, while the Chinese have said they've cut off all imports from North Korea, in fact, the intelligence agencies are showing our Congress uh, any time they want to know about the leaking and the smuggling. So I hope the president, the two presidents in Beijing are talking very seriously about this. The crude oil, it's still flowing under the Yalu River. Used to be 900,000 tons a year. How much is still going? We don't know. We do know the Chinese are putting tens of thousands of tons of corn into North Korea because the North Koreans are going to begin starving again in the midst of this coming famine and winter. So the Chinese are propping at the same time they're talking, at the same time they're pushing. Is there a tipping point when North Korea runs out of fuel oil that it can then refine and help out with its own military? We need to know and that's the, street, the key strategic question. If you put a choke on him, where's the tipping point? How much time have you got until he can miniaturize one of those eggs and put it on one of those birds? I think that is the clock that's ticking. In short, if the Chinese have fate control over the North Koreans, we want them to exercise behavior control. And that translation is not easy. And I'm waiting to see the outcome of Beijing. Cyber ops. This really intrigues me. It was inherited from the Obama administration. It has been robusted, from what I can tell, by the Trump administration. Here's something that really intrigues me. Of those 85 missile launches under the kid, Remember how many of those medium-range Musadons blew up? And isn't it interesting that when they blow up and fail, there is no twittering and not a comment out of the White House? I'm very intrigued by the deafening lack of noise about that. I'm encouraged by that. Who can do cyber ops on North Korean command and control? The Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, and North Korean technicians. Just to suggest this intrigues me. <laughs> Dialogue, negotiation, you bet. It's always been there. In spite of the hysteria in the New York Times editor's office, it's always been there. The talking has always occurred very carefully. It's occurred over the last 10 years. It's been occurring, I think, since May or even April. Um, the president said, in October, if something can happen where we can negotiate, I'm always open to that. In Seoul, I really believe it makes sense for North Korea to come to the table and make a deal for the people of North Korea and the people of the world. And then, of course, military strikes. This is a defensive alliance between the United States and South Korea. 
In wartime, it will be led by a four-star American general after he gets permission and authorization from the American government and the South Korean government. That arrangement, the, command, the Combined Forces Command, is under review. It's been under review before. If it changes, there'll be two commands, or the American becomes the deputy. We'll see how that goes. Clearly, it is a periodic, understandable issue of sovereignty on the part of the South Koreans. So what's the likely emerging mix? Here's what I think it is. Continued and robusted deterrence. You'd better believe it. Secondly, tighter sanctions and embargoes on North Korea and on any government assisting the DPRK with banking, military, or combat capabilities. Continuing information war, and I hope robusted information war, to drive the regime nuts. Four, I think, I think, a plan to shoot down any, or attempt to shoot down, any ICBM launched in the vicinity of the United States. Of course, that's a bullet trying to hit a bullet. That isn't easy. Fifth, allied proposals to resume talks. Talks, not necessarily negotiations, talks. I think contact is occurring. I have no idea by who. This leaves unsaid, and with no twittering, the possibility of cyber operations. And I assume the Chinese willingness to intervene one way or another if the balloon goes up. Thank you very much. All right. So let's move on to some questions we have for the speakers. So my first question, and I'll pass this down for y'all. Um, this is for all of you. So South Korea recently elected a new president, Moon Jae-in. Um, he's expressed an interest in pursuing a very different strategy than the ones that um, have been discussed so far, which is increased engagement. Um, you know, and he believes that might be an effective strategy. Has this stance created tension between the United States and South Korea? Um, and then how does South Korea kind of fit in with all of this? What is, you know, what about their strategic, their economic, their political needs? How does it fit in with this, this crisis? You know, is this working? Yeah. You know, one of the, um, I think things are changing quite a lot on a lot of different, uh, a lot of different directions. This um, hydrogen bomb explosion a few weeks ago, to me, really, really is a big, big event. Plus the developments of the ICBM. Uh, I'm not that worried about an ICBM. I think North Korea would be. I don't think they're stupid, and that would be pretty stupid to shoot an ICBM at us. But they're clearly trying to provoke us with an ICBM. And uh, if you think about it in terms of game theory, do any of y'all study game theory? It's a really interesting part of economics. Most of my students would. Do they? Yeah. yeah. And um, this is all the, and I play a lot of tennis. It's a great game to play. Um, uh, there's something to be said for a two-person game. A two-person game, usually you say a zero-sum game. You, I win, you lose, right? It happened to be last two nights ago. I lost, right? <laughs> Nothing to win about it. But you play the game because you generally like to play the game. But the, um, uh, by um, initiating an ICBM capability, North Korea has launched a two-person game with the United States. Wow. What a stupid thing to do. We need to make sure he understands how stupid that is. Because it effectively takes South Korea out of the equation. Now, South Korea is concerned about it. Yeah, we could have a war with North Korea. Well, you know, they're saying, don't we, don't we South Korea, have a vote in this? Well, to be honest, not necessarily. If North Korea shoots a missile at us, we're going to shoot back, no doubt about it. Doesn't matter if Seoul is there or not. So uh, it does change the nature of the debate. I mean, if we have time, we'll, of course, talk to North Korea, to South Korea. If we launch an attack on them, certainly that would be... Uh, in cooperation with South Korea. But um, it is a different game with this hydrogen bombs and ICBMs and split-second um, fights. So I think uh, Moon, 
Moon Jong-un is having to deal with this change. It's not a change in his policy or our policy. It's a change in the landscape provided by North Korea. I think it's a huge mistake for North Korea to do this. Um, but they're, they're the ones doing it. Don't forget North Korea is the instigator here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, f first of all, uh, in my opinion, I don't think that there is a higher, you know, the, uh, you know, the tension between the South Korea and the United States. A higher tension exists between the North Korea and the United States, and China and the United States. And uh, so I think, you know, South Korea, you know, the. Uh, be, the reason I'm saying this is uh, South Korea has been kind of neglected so far because you know, North Korean strategy is what well, they want to deal directly with the United States. So they intentionally neglect you know, the South Korean you know, the intervention. So, uh, so that is the fact, I think. And uh, given that, you know, the, so the current cha uh, current president of the of South Korea, uh, Moon Jae-in, uh, he wanted to be a mediator because you know, he initially he wanted to uh, emphasize the role of the dialogue, but at the moment, because in North Korea has no intention <laughs> to uh, join the kind of you know the I mean the peaceful dialogue, so you know the, it is meaningless. So you know the uh, I believe President Moon Jae-in has changed uh, his strategy, but he doesn't want to let that go as a mediator because you know everybody is kind of you know, the, having very difficult time. So somebody should be a peacemaker, <laughs> okay? So that's what he is doing. And, uh, and I believe you know, the current relationship between the, you know, the United States and South Korea is, is very good. You know, the, we are still a strong ally. And, uh, you know, the, as to, and of course, you know, the recently, you know, President, Moon, uh, President Donald Trump has visit, visited in South Korea, and I think uh, he was very happy. And uh, he also asked for something, and uh, so, uh, and the President Moon Jae-in also promised some you know, good present, such as some, you know, the military equipment purchase. Okay, so I think everybody is happy, and uh, so so far I think there is no problem between the United States and South Korea. And the South Korean uh, president, he is uh, trying to uh, improve the current, you know, the uh, situation with a very high tension. So he's trying to help. You know. So uh, that's what I think. Right. All right. Um, so my next question, again, it's it's for. Um, whoever's interested. Um, so recently, Rear Admiral Michael J. Dumont, on behalf of the Department of Defense, he stated, um, quote, the only way to locate and destroy with complete certainty all components of North Korea's nuclear weapons program is through a ground invasion, end quote. Um, what are the implications of that? Um, because one of, you know, I noticed on a lot of the options, we weren't really discussing um, the prospect of a, a of a land invasion and the, the you know consequences of that, um, and you know what are the consequences for the United States? What are the consequences for South Korea? Um, yeah. Well, um, I think the United States has learned uh, in its generosity and in its uh, noble reactions, I think, to uh, North Korean aggression and to North Vietnamese aggression, that getting into uh, into land wars on East Asia is not a good idea. We lost 38,000 in the Korean War. We lost 53,000 in the Vietnamese War. I don't think a, a, a land invasion is in the cards or necessary. I am intrigued by the statements out of Beijing that are put at times in something called Global Times, which is an outlet in part for Chinese thinking. And what they've said is they will not permit uh, Manchuria to be irradiated with North Korean uh, atomic or, or hydrogen debris. They've also said they do not favor a structural change on the Korean Peninsula. Um, I think with no particular information that the Chinese know more about where those glowing eggs are than anybody else and I think that if the North Korean regime fractures or goes nuts or begins to preempt, that the Chinese will intervene 
and garrison the command and control areas if they don't already, prior to that, have destabilized the command and control areas. I wish there was an arrangement, a talking arrangement, between Beijing and Washington about this. I don't think it exists, however, because the Chinese won't talk. But it is a core interest for the Chinese. It's a core interest for South Korea. And it's an important interest for the United States. So I don't think you have to invade to necessarily stop a launching or detonation capability. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree quite a lot. And I'm, I was quite curious with the guy's statement. I was dumbfounded by it uh, for several reasons. But My no, not your statement. <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten the uh, general's statement, the general's name. Uh, but um, Admiral uh, Charles Dumont. Partly, uh, he said all of it. So it's like uh, taking away their whole nuclear program, which is very extensive. Now, but also all the production and all the, you know, all the uranium. And all that's a huge project. That would be. But to take out the weapons, that depends on if you know where the weapons are. And nobody in this room, I don't know. Nobody's going to tell anybody if we know where those weapons are. It's kind of funny. People will say, oh, we don't know where their weapons are. Well, how on earth do you know that we don't know where their weapons are? For one thing, Kim Jong-un doesn't know if we know where their weapons are. And I hope he thinks we know where their weapons are and that we could take them out. There's nothing about a nuclear weapon that you can't take it out. The command and control system is enormously complicated. You know that mother of all bombs that we used? And that might have been signaling. I'm kind of thinking, is that in Afghanistan? Um, Syria. Where? It yeah. Was Syria. I'm thinking that's the kind of bomb you use to take out nuclear weapons. I think we were signaling, maybe. Yeah, we might know where they are. We might be able to take them out. But that wouldn't be the whole program. So yeah, I, I'm I'm quite agreeing. Okay. Remember something that uh, occurred in Iran called Stutznets? Remember this? It's interesting, isn't it? So um, President Trump's currently in East Asia. I believe he's in China at the moment. He's going to be in Vietnam tomorrow. Um, you know, and it sounds like China. You know, I mean, it doesn't sound like it. China is pivotal to this to this crisis and helping us manage it. Um, and it sounds like a lot of the the responsibility for dealing with it is on China and you know to some degree Russia as well. Um, what can we do from an American perspective, from a South Korean perspective? What more can we do to, you know, encourage them to put more pressure on them? If if that's the if that's the solution, what what's the way forward for that? Um, I would simply say, once the Chinese realize that what is occurring between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, more weapons, tighter coordination and telling the North Koreans, don't ever, ever make that fundamental mistake. Once the Chinese conclude that that has tipped over against their national interests, then I think we see the Chinese come to the ball. Uh, I think on this matter, you know, there are, there's a conflict of interest, right? In the, uh, I think you know the China's you know the worst dream is you know the having a border with unified Korea. So you know the, at the moment you know the uh, China has you know North Korea, which is a strong ally of China. So the 38 degree line, that is effectively borderline of China and the United States. If we take the South Korea as a strong ally, right? So if you know the, something happened in China. I mean, this in North Korea. Then you know the probably the possibility may be what you know the North Korea and South Korea maybe be a one country, and then you know the China should border with unified South Korea, which is a ally of the United States. So China is really uh, afraid of that situation. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. But you know the. Uh, so I think I think you know the from I don't know perspective of Korean. You know, the, I do not want any, you know, the war on the Korean Peninsula. So, at the moment, I really hope 
to maintain the status quo, and I hope everybody can work on some changes in North Korea, not using the violence, but as you, you know, the, you also mentioned about it. You know, the, we may uh, increase, you know, the the degree of, you know, the economic sanctions more and more, and that may help, you know, the uh, making some changes in the North Korea uh, from the bottom, so that they may uh, be a kind of, you know, different regime eventually. So that's my uh, hope. Yeah, I mentioned I thought that the Chinese are starting to come around, and this is new up until November, no, a year ago. And it's not really Trump doing it, it's North Korea's nuclear explosions that are doing it. Uh, I think Trump is adding pressure to it. But this chart up here is their North Korea's trade imbalance with China. That's China's perspective, so a plus is a Chinese <coughs> surplus. And you notice what happened in the second quarter of this year, a huge increase in China's surplus means a huge uh, North Korean deficit, big jump in North Korea's deficit. Third quarter, it's not quite as clear as that. Fourth quarter, I'm pretty convinced, is going to be an equally huge uh, Chinese surplus, North Korean deficit. This is going to put pressure on the North Korean regime, no doubt. Uh, the most positive thing I've seen this year in North Korea, uh, in, um, what is it, April or May, Xi Jinping and... Uh, Trump had their meeting in, um, I can't say that word, Mar Mar in Florida. Mar 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 <laughs> whatever that is, in Florida. In Florida. And uh, they came away, uh, you know, shaking and hugging all this stuff uh, and saying these nasty things about North Korea. And um, uh, about a week later, for the first time ever, there were two articles. One, of, one a Chinese friend of mine wrote this article, uh, said, um, you know, we need to be, we Chinese need to be questioning whether we should continue to give crude oil to North Korea. They've never said anything like that. Remember that? And then a week after that, diplomats in Pyongyang noticed the price of gasoline tripled. Wow. So you think e-gasoline is not that important in North Korea? They don't have many cars. But the diesel price also tripled. Diesel is extremely important. So a little couple words out of Trump and Xi and a newspaper in China and the price of gasoline triples. That tells you North Korea is becoming vulnerable to these kind of actions. A very positive, for me, uh, result. Right. So um, I think now we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, if you're interested in asking a question of the panelists, somebody in specific or the panel as a full, um, raise your hand. Um, this question is for anybody who's interested in answering. To what extent does China view North Korea as a buffer zone in and if an invasion or decapitation attack was initiated, how would this impact the U.S. relationship with China? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, to what extent does China view North Korea as a buffer zone and if an invasion or decapitation attack was initiated, how would this impact the relationship with the U.S. and China? That's going to be a chaos. <laughs> That's probably right. The decapitation business, must admit, bothers me a lot. Just the word is awful. And um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not completely sold on killing Kim Jong-un. I'm, I'm a little bit of a believer he can be reformed. I'm, um, but I'm losing that belief. I thought more that way five years ago than now. Um, I am thinking he's a, a, re a rational person. And rational persons like to stay alive and maintain their kingdoms. And I would argue, rather than decapitate him, I don't think we could anyway, but if we could, I'd rather him think uh, we could help him resolve the country's problems. And I think China would be quite on board with that. As, as the um, buffer zone idea is really important, I think. Uh, by that, what she means is, uh, China probably doesn't like a U.S. Army sitting on, their, on the Yellow River. They fought us once. They probably don't want to fight us again. We certainly don't want to fight them again. Um, um, so the buffer idea is, you know, you keep a uh, North Korea alive. This is a tragedy for North Korea. They're played with in this kind of way by the big powers. It's uh, horrible. But um, I'm thinking we are partly responsible here. 
and that we need to make somehow very, very clear to China that our long-term interests are not in occupying Korea, even South Korea. We could get out of there. If Korea can unify and become a democratic, peaceful, prosperous country, uh, everybody in the region would be very happy. We wouldn't need to have an army there. We're only there for Korea's sake, South Korea's sake. China needs, somehow we need to convince China that. A lot of our military, a lot of our people sort of think we're in South Korea, you know, to sign a, a def fight a war with China. Oh, that's just, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Our army in South Korea is a target for China. They would be a hostage to China nowadays. China has very advanced missiles, stuff. We don't, we're not there, we're not in Korea to defend ourselves against China. China has nothing to do with it. That's the message we need to get to China so it can sort of back off and say, no, America's not going to eat up North Korea. Yeah, I think this uh, kabuki dance that's going on between uh, Xi and Trump is absolutely fascinating. It is leaning more and more into the contradictions of Chinese policy. They hate what's going on by Kim Jong-un, but they don't have behavior control over him. They would have fate control. They could destroy the place if they had to. They could overrun it. But they don't want uh, an American South Korean military force on the Yalu River. The last time that happened, they went in and they lost at least 400,000 men in horrendous uh, circumstances. So what Bill is saying makes, makes a lot of sense. Our communication has to be sophisticated, leveraged, layered, and different to work the interests. But the Chinese have gotten themselves into this, as have the Russians. They've created this monster. And now they're, they're playing games. They don't know how to extract or go in or modify it. And I, I think good American policy exploits the contradictions between the adversaries. And there's plenty to exploit there. If you don't mind, I have uh, two questions for two professors. First, um, Professor Brown. Uh, so you said that the international community is um, propping up the regime in a way, and that it should be more up to the uh, North Korean civilians to uh, rise against the regime. But how can the international community win over the hearts and minds of North Korean civilians when things such as a lack of aid and economic sanctions will only make them more impoverished and reliant upon the regime? You know, the, um, what you said at the last is most interesting to me. Um, because what happened with the famine, again, it's kind of 20 years ago now, but about a million people died in the famine. That uh, told the North Koreans one in very important lesson, that they can't rely on their own regime. They were, uh, as, at that point, they were a, a rationed economy, so you basically get your ration from the government. You go to get your food from the ra the, f the government didn't have the food, so they didn't get the ration, and there was nothing left but to die, a million of them died. A million people died. They've learned that lesson, though, by now, and they don't trust their own government for good reason. That's why the market is developing. They're putting away their own food in case of emergency. They're buying and selling, trading. It's a great uh, movement toward a self-sufficiency of the people instead of the, depending on the government. That's just an all, uh, kind of a, a long way of getting at the issue of aid. Aid, uh, economic development aid is an incredibly, um, we all want to help people that are poor. Certainly people are starving to death. Absolutely, if, if North Koreans are starving to death, I would be the first, actually I almost went in there at one point, try to give them U.S. government food aid to them. But if they're not starving, if it's not that critical, aid, um, it's like, um, you know, we did this with South Korea. When I was growing up in South Korea in the 50s and 60s, we were dumping huge amounts of aid into South Korea because during the Korean War they were starving. But after the Korean War they weren't starving and the food aid was killing their agriculture. So aid well, is a very intrusive thing to do to a country. We don't allow it in America. We call it dumping. Giving stuff to America. Oh no, you're not going to do that. So. Um, 
I'm not against aid, don't get me wrong, but it has to be done very carefully not to um, uh, discourage production. That's what this aid to North Korea has done. It's discouraged production. It's discouraged North Korean exports. And it's really interesting since the uh, aid has stopped pretty much. That's one thing I congratulate the Obama administration on. They've stopped giving aid to North Korea. Nobody's, except for Chinese crude oil, there's no aid that I can think of going into North Korea. And what is happening? The economy is growing. There's no starvation in North Korea. No food aid, better production. No, no starvation. Um, the, the regime is having to allow markets. A lot of good things are happening because that flow of aid, a lot of it from the UN, has stopped. Now, again, if there's famine, you know, you have to help them. But um, I'm not, see, I'm not sure that there's, there's a little bit of Chinese food aid. I don't think it's significant compared to the production. Um, they mostly feed themselves now, uh, which is a good thing. So um, this aid issue is complicated. It's, you really have to study economics carefully, sociology carefully. But um, this is one of the things I've been very frustrated with a lot of our policy people, certainly a lot of South Korean policy is very guilty of this. Politicians will take aid, oh, I'm going to help the poor people, uh, but actually they're helping their own producers. Uh, it's very complicated business, and it takes a very sophisticated argument trying to help reform North Korea, not uh, make it a beggar state. Thank you. Um, and my other question is for Professor Grenzer. So the last time the United States had a large-scale air campaign was, I believe, back in Vietnam. And that was received rather, and the effects of it were received rather negatively um, by many Vietnamese and a large portion of Americans as well. Would you say that, if necessary, the United States Air Force is more prepared if uh, such a campaign uh, in jungle terrain like North Korea, uh, if they're prepared for it? Oh, oh, yes, I'd say so. If you look at the uh, airstrikes, there must be now 16, 17,000. Uh, American and uh, NATO airstrikes against uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and various uh, uh, targets in Syria. You notice how very careful, the word is surgical, how very careful the United States and the Allies are with collateral damage. The problem in Vietnam was that uh, we, we did so much destruction to the economy of the very country we were attempting to defend, a noble effort in my view, that we created enormous inflation and refugee flows. We learned from that. So we're doing much more at this point, much more pinpoint types of targeting. I think the, and you saw that the president ordered uh, tomahawk strikes against Assad's chemical weapons initiative that had started. So I think uh, if there has to be strikes, that is, if a preemption begins to occur by the North Koreans, or has occurred, and there have to be strikes, I think they'd be extremely accurate. And I hope it doesn't happen, um, but, but I'm very confident, having taught out at Maxwell and seen, uh, talk to these people and so on, I'm very confident that it's, uh, it's very precise. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't... Um Sorry, my question wasn't as specific as I meant it to be. I meant a large-scale uh, air campaign in a jungle-like terrain. I don't think we'd do that. You're, you're saying, would there be a large air campaign against North Korea? Is that what you're saying? Yes. No, I don't think so. I don't think it'd be necessary. All right, we have time for one more question. Hey, so I had a question for Mr. Brown and Mr. Grinter. Uh, Mr. Brown, you had talked about how you don't think we're doing enough to really make very concrete kind of shows of force. What are some tactical options you think? Do you think it's, you know, parking a carrier group or like we've done in Europe with Russia deploying F-22 or B-2 squadrons or, I mean, because it seems like sometimes we're doing so many things in the background, but we're not giving them a concrete force that says if you do this we will come bomb the ever-living crap out of you. Are, are you in the ROTC? No, sir. <laughs> Good. Um, 
I think the effect of things we are doing, if they are particularly successful, will not, will not be made public. That's first of all. Secondly, I think we are sick. I think the Trump administration is signaling very carefully but thoroughly to Pyongyang, do not make a major mistake. I remember when Menachem Begin, the Israeli prime minister, used to say to Saddam Hussein, never, never make that mistake. Saddam understood that. This particular young thug in Pyongyang understands it. It is my understanding that after we uh, evicted Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait, that the films of that particular theater were sent to North Korea, something to watch on a lazy Sunday afternoon in Pyongyang. They know exactly, they don't know when or how, but they know exactly the degree of lethality that can be put onto those people. And so I agree with uh, the other um, panelists here. They don't want a war. They need the tension. Uh, North Korean women uh, uh, sing songs about how they can cut the throats of Americans. I mean, it is a thoroughly brainwashed, jeopardized society. But he is not stupid. He is cruel. He is shrewd. He is rational. And we're dealing with him on a rational basis, too. Yeah, I think um, a big lesson for all of us, uh, to me, one of the most disastrous events in the last 10 years. In 2010, uh, as Kim Jong-un was probably getting ready to come to power, his father was still around, uh, they just up and torpedoed a South Korean Navy ship. I mean, wow, sank it in the middle of the night. Uh, and South Korea and U.S. did not respond. Amazingly, and a military attack on a South Korean Navy killed, what, 43 sailors. Um, I think it was mostly, our, you know, was, I think our government persuaded South Korea not to respond. Uh, man, they, we need to respond. I don't think that mistake will ever happen again. For, mainly because the South Korean government, we tend to forget, we think it's our government that's defending South Korea. South Korea has a huge, very proficient military. They have a much bigger air force. They're buying um, F-35s. Is that what it is? Yeah. Lots of them. They are a modern, very efficient uh, fighting machine. Uh, and they're getting better and better. Uh, our, our role is important there. But if there's a war, it's going to be mostly South Korea on North Korea. And uh, they're getting, I think the South Koreans are getting very good at it. And I don't think they're going to let any North Koreans sink another ship again. The last government, Park geun government, made very clear and I'm moon, moon, the new government's making it very clear, none of that kind of monkey business. So uh, that's the kind of um, upped readiness that I'm talking about. Um, and I think it requires some different weaponry, faster weaponry. Uh, one, another discouraging thing to me is the U.S. has spent $14 billion, $7 billion of our money, $7 billion of South Korean money, to build this brand new huge base at Camp Humphreys that you saw Trump at yesterday, right? $14 billion, that is a ton of money, guys, for a military base that to me looks like a target for a North Korean nuclear missile. I mean, what, we were, we're trying to, what do you call, pull together all our forces in one space? Does that make sense? I, no, I mean, I think, uh, I think we have, our military has to wake up I'm not a military guy, but I think our military has to wake up. South Korea military has to wake up to a much different world with uh, hydrogen bombs 50 miles away. It's a, you know, and that to me it can be safe because I don't think you know we uh, the North Koreans know we can we can win any war, but we can't allow them to get a hostage situation where they think we're so afraid of them that they can get away with sinking a Navy ship. So hopefully that's the last time we'll ever see something like that happen. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. I hope, you know, there were more 
economics related question, but there was none, so <laughs> my job is not really related here. Uh, but I think I want to say just one thing. You know, the uh, Saddam Hussein didn't have nuclear weapon. Okay, uh, Kim Jong Un has nuclear weapon, and uh, he has ISBM, and he has. Uh, well, I'm not the you know, military expert, but SLBM. So you know, North Korea can shoot you know, the nukes uh, from the submarine. So that means it is really, really difficult. Of course, you know, they may not be complete the technologically, but they have the possibility. So if you know, the, we think about some possibility of military attack, you know, of course, you know, the people are saying you know, it should be pin exactly pinpoint the exact location. But that is not very difficult, I think. And uh, so, if you know the, something happened, like uh, some military attack uh, occur in North Korea, that may create a huge mess. So we have to be extremely careful. And uh, I'm talking about a lot of people uh, in uh, not only in, uh, North Korea and South Korea, including 140,000 you know the American citizens in South Korea. So uh, this is very difficult situation. So. Uh, if possible, I think uh, I want to avoid any possible military, you know, the uh, deployment in North Korea. Okay, that's my hope. Just one very quick uh, factual codicil. When the North Koreans shelled the South Korean island, the South Korean uh, armed forces shelled back and laid a big artillery barrage onto North Korean property. The problem was the DEFCON arrangements and the criteria arrangements within CFC for American DEFCOM and South Korean DEFCOM were not identical. And it took about a year of negotiations back and forth to bring into complete alignment the early warning and DEFCOM arrangements. So there was a degree of retaliation there. Thank you. All right, so to offer some concluding remarks, um, I'm going to ask uh, Hope Stockton to come up. She is the Executive Director for the Office of Professional Continuing Edu Education here at Auburn. Good evening. And uh, I have a wonderful role this evening. Uh, my role is to say thank you. <laughs> so uh, I want to get started with that, and I just want to uh, say a heartfelt thanks to our distinguished guest, uh, the Deputy Consul General of the Republic of Korea in Atlanta, uh, Mr. Lee Sang-ho. Thank you so much for your support of this event. We truly appreciate that. The Vice President of University Outreach, Dr. Royal Rickers Cook, uh, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Joseph Astrup, for their support and um, uh, really uh, bolstering this event. We truly appreciate that. Um, thank you to our panelists and our moderator. And so, uh, Dr. Saw, I believe that you have some gifts for our panelists. And she will distribute those. But I wanted to recognize, once again, Dr. Matthew Clary. Thank you so much. You did a wonderful job of moderating the event this evening. Uh, Dr. I'm going to mispronounce that. <laughs> Hyung Woo, who Kim, <laughs> Dr. Kim, from the Professor of Economics at uh, Auburn University, Dr. William Brown, uh, with the School of Foreign Services at Georgetown University, Dr. Lawrence Grinter, Professor Emeritus from the Air War College. The comments were very much appreciated. Thank you. But our thanks would not be complete without recognizing the Korea Corner. Um, and the Korea Corner was established earlier this year. Uh, it was uh, sponsored and, and funded by the, uh, the Consul General of the Republic of Korea, as well as the Vice President of University Outreach, and we truly appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Suyun Sa is the leader of the Korea Corner here at Auburn University, and we truly appreciate her coordinating the events here this evening. And also Dr. Daniel Yu, um, who is the director, uh, Assistant Director for Global Leadership Training Initiative. Uh, within our office, and um, he's had some help from a graduate assistant. I don't know if he's still here, Jonathan Walker. Is Jonathan around? Uh, but we do have a number of, uh, of volunteers that have also supported this event, and I would like for the volunteers, if you would just stand up for just a second, 
anyone who has volunteered, handed out programs, helped with name tags, many of them may already be outside, but I truly appreciate our volunteers that have helped with this event because it takes a lot of people to put something like this on. Um, and I also uh, would like to recognize some of my fellow colleagues from the University Outreach. Uh, Dr. Chapewa Thomas is here. She's the Director of Faculty Engagement, and I believe Dr. Stacey Nixon was here, but I think she may have had to step out. So I appreciate their uh, attendance at the event this evening. And one of our great trainers is here this evening, Dr. William Souser, and uh, we truly appreciate you. And I see Dr. Gillespie in the back. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Is Mayor Ham still here? I know he attended the reception earlier this evening, but may have had to step out. And finally, I want to recognize all of the automotive manufacturing presidents um, and representatives that are in the audience, because you have been such a support for Auburn University and for the training that we provide, but also for this event. And uh, we really appreciate your um, work with us here at the university and the relationship that we have with you. So thank you very much. All right, we hope your knowledge was increased this evening by the discussion, by the comments that were made by our panelists and moderators. There were some excellent questions that I heard coming from the audience. And thank you all for coming this evening. We wish you well. <laughs>